All right. I apologize if you logged in a couple of minutes ago and then everything disappeared. Had a little hiccup there. Uh, but let me say again, welcome you to our midweek Bible study. We are in a transition. We, we've been studying the Old Testament wisdom books. And uh, we are going to uh, start looking at the New Testament book of James, which we mentioned uh, when studying the wisdom books that James was the New Testament book most like those. Uh, and so thought it was good for us to move in that direction. And uh, we're going to start tonight in James chapter 1, and especially verse 1 of James chapter 1 will be our focus as we open this up. Uh, I did send out, for those of you who ha are on our email list, uh, a study guide or a handout. Uh, when you print it out, it looks something like that. Um, and I'll try and do that each week for these. Um, you may make some notes or, or may help a little bit following as I ramble on. Uh, but but um, looking forward to working through some of these passages with you in the book of James. And so I invite you to join us each, each week about this time. You know, I think uh, most of us fall into the temptation of name dropping from time to time. Um, if we have known or know somebody who has become famous for some reason, or maybe we know someone who knows someone famous, and we just like to, to drop that little tidbit into casual conversation, maybe to get into attention or impress one another, I guess some some degree of that there's nothing wrong with uh but you know something like uh, you know my my third cousin twice removed once had a friend whose uncle used to deliver newspapers to al capone that kind of thing i actually had something like that uh, once i was i was on the golf course by myself and ran into a guy an older guy i can't even remember where this was it was some place that I didn't regularly play, but I met this guy on the golf course, and he told me he he used to mow Al Capone's lawn. Thought of all things uh, to tell a total stranger, but that's what that's the name he dropped on me, and part of the reason I used that name in my example. But you know, there's something about being close to or knowing somebody famous that we like to use to impress others or to make an impression. Um, let me ask you this as we begin thinking uh, tonight. What if you were related to Jesus? Um, now, I know if we're children of God by faith that we're all kinsmen to Jesus. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about if you were actually physically related to Jesus of Nazareth. Um, wouldn't you find that a hard fact not to drop into a conversation from time to time? And even if your motives were good, you know, if uh, you weren't trying to impress anybody or brag or anything like that, but you were trying to tell folks something that they need to hear about the Lord. And, and you thought, hey, if they knew that I was Jesus' brother, they, they might take me more seriously. They might listen. Well, we can understand why we'd be motivated to do that. And for that reason, I've always been impressed with James the author of the book of James in, in our New Testament, because James was Jesus' brother. Uh, they shared the same mom, Mary. Uh, Jesus had four half-brothers, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, according to Matthew chapter 13, verse 55. And so 
if you were writing a book, a letter to be read by the Christian community that you were influencing and teaching, and you know you had really important things to say, you knew were important, vital things, and you knew people needed to hear them, might you not point out somewhere uh, that, that you grew up with the very person that you're preaching uh, and that your audience is striving to learn about and follow? Uh, you shared the same house, the same town, Nazareth, um, the same carpenter's shop with Father Joseph. Don't you think that you might slip that little fact in right at the beginning of your letter, you know, and say, for instance, at the beginning, James, a brother of Jesus, to really grab their attention. But look at how James begins his letter in, in James chapter 1 and verse 1. It actually says, this is the way he starts, he says, James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's really sort of a weak way of translating that verse because the word servant that is normally used in English translations is actually the word for slave. It was the word they used in that world for, for slave. And so it'd be better translated and understood this way. James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only relationship with Jesus that James mentions is that he is a slave of Jesus. And I've always been surprised at that and frankly impressed with that. And as I've studied this book, written by James, I've always felt that that sort of is in keeping with the entire message of the book, this attitude that he displays. I uh, saw a great bumper sticker one time in a store that I may, uh, I, I believe, may be a, a, a catchy way of, of stating the theme of the book of James. It's sort of our title for for the study tonight, this bumper sticker said, less talk, more walk. Less talk, more walk. That's what James is all about. Uh, less talk, more walk. So the book of James discusses practical, everyday Christian living. Uh, wisdom kind of stuff, like we see in the book of Proverbs and, and places like that. Uh, there's almost no discussion in James about what we might call the great doctrines of the Christian faith, you know, things like salvation and maybe baptism or, or heaven and hell and, and that kind of thing. Uh, James instead talks about very daily types of issues. Uh, James reminds us that what you do matters. Uh, it's not just what you believe. So in other words, you're not just talking about beliefs, pra beliefs, doctrines, that kind of thing. Uh, he, he emphasizes what you do with that. It's not just what you preach or teach or proclaim. It's what you do as well. Less talk, more walk. James emphasizes what a daily walk with Jesus looks like. And so it's sort of like boots on the ground Christianity is, is what James teaches. And, you know, he's going to write about, for instance, what's it like to be a Christian while suffering? Okay, what's that look like? How do you act when you're suffering as a Christian? He'll talk about how a, a servant of Jesus deals with material wealth. There's a lot in James about money and wealth and that kind of thing and, and what's 
our response to is supposed to be. He, he will instruct on how a disciple of the Lord Jesus talks, okay? How he speaks, what kind of words he uses. And so I guess you say it is a very practical book. Some say the most practical in, in all the New Testament. Now, all the books are practical when we understand them, but, but James is just so specific in addressing uh, issues of everyday Christian living, uh, what the Christian walk is all about. So there is less talk and more walk in the way James approaches his teaching. So let me just give you some examples here uh, in this first look at the book uh, in our study. Just some examples of some of the great practical things that James says about living for Jesus daily. Okay, just run through some well-known verses from this book. Chapter 1, verse 22. Remember James says, Be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. See, it matters what you do, not just what you believe, not just what you say, but what you do. Be doers of the word, and not hearers only. About five verses later, chapter 1, verse 27, he says this, Religion. Now, when, when he says religion, we might think, oh, here comes the doctrine. They're going to tell us uh, the kinds of things that we need to believe and so forth. But he says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. What do you think he might say? What is true religion? Religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this. Well, you believe this and this and this, right? What James says is this. This is pure and undefiled religion. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Practical. Less talk, more walk. Chapter 2. A couple of verses in chapter 2, verse 14 and verse 17. We'll sort of mash them together here. James says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, see, talks a good game, says, What good is it if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Then he goes on. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. He's always emphasizing what you do. Chapter 4. Skip ahead chapter 4, verse 4. He asks a question. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? That word enmity, something like hatred. Friendship with the world is is enmity with God. How you live, what you do in relationship to the world matters. Chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Uh, again, just surveying these for their practicality. He says, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Okay, Very practical advice. Resist the devil. Chapter 5, verse 13, begins again with a question. Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Uh, it's just amazing how it's very simple advice, but so powerful. Are you suffering? Pray. Are you happy? Sing praise. Makes sense. Then also chapter 5, verse 16, he says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So it's just sort of a, a little selection there of the kinds of things, the riches 
the practical advice and teaching in this wonderful letter that James wrote in the first century. Practical, powerful teaching. And it's one of those books, sort of like we suggested with Proverbs, read a proverb a day, that kind of thing. Read James regularly. It's just something that will speak to your life in almost every verse very clearly and very simply. I think we could all use a heavy dose of James on a regular basis because we all need to be reminded that it's not what you say, it's what you do that really shows if you belong to the Lord. A living faith is lived out daily. On the other hand, if all one does is talk a good game, you know, if if one just has a bunch of rules memorized and a bundle of neatly packaged doctrines and beliefs stored away in their brain uh, that they can recall and maybe attach verses to, it never really affects the way they live daily. That's a dead faith. And it's useless. Okay, Not that some of those things aren't important, but if they're not lived, it's useless. We want to have a living faith. We want less talk and more walk. James promotes that approach to the way of Christ. A, a vital living faith. What you do matters. How you live daily matters. Now, before we sort of tie this up, I want to look at James, the individual, uh, the, the, the author, for another moment, and, and, and then we'll, uh, we'll finish up for this time. Again, James, uh, the brother of Jesus, one of four brothers. You might recall that uh, during Jesus' ministry, when he walked the earth, these four guys didn't believe in him as far as, you know, who he was saying he was and what he was doing early on. In fact, they tried to stop him. Um, they tried to be a stumbling block to him. They, well, let's, let's actually look and see what they said about him. In Gospel of Mark is one good place to look. Chapter 3. Um, Jesus has just chosen the 12, and he's been healing people and doing some things. He's really attracting attention. Sort of his, his popularity is rising. And it says in uh, Mark 3, verse 20, Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. That is, he and his disciples. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him. For they were saying, he is out of his mind. That's Jesus' brothers and perhaps his, his sisters, maybe uh, Mary. We, we don't know. It's not specific. But his family says he's crazy. He's out of his mind. And then that chapter closes. Verse 31, his mother and his brothers came and, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him, and a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. In these early days, it was uh, a tough relationship between, between Jesus and his brothers, his physical brothers, his family. Uh, they, they were not believers, it seems, and they thought that he had lost it. Um, and so he makes, the Lord makes this statement that his true family was not necessarily his physical family, but those who were his followers, who, who were doing the will of God. So, I bring that up to ask this question, and I wish I could uh, 
you know, physically ask you and have you respond here, but how did that change? That, that relationship between Jesus and his family, Jesus and his brothers. In other words, how did James go from saying at one point he's out of his mind to saying he is my Lord and I am his slave here in James 1.1? 1, 1. How, how is that transition made? How did he go from one who rejected faith in Christ to one who embraced it and taught it and became a leader of the faith, who became an elder in the early Jerusalem church and, and wrote this great book that we have to study from and benefit from today. How did that change take place? Well, you know, for an answer to that, I, I just take you to one last text tonight. Uh, from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. And let's remind ourselves of these powerful words that the Apostle Paul later on records for us in this important chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. So beginning, let's see, about um, verse 3. Paul writes, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive though some have fallen asleep. And then right at the beginning of verse 7, then he appeared to James. After Jesus died on the cross and after his glorious resurrection on the third day, we know that he appeared to many people. There are only a few who are specifically named that he appeared to. Uh, we know he appeared to hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, only a few are named, and one of them, of course, is James. I want you to sort of imagine what that scene was like. The resurrected Jesus making a special individual appearance to his own brother, who had up to that time apparently rejected him, who called him crazy, who, who tried to seize him in the midst of his ministry. What a moment that had to have been. You know, we get a story about Paul, who wrote those words we read from 1 Corinthians 15, his conversion. It, when he saw the resurrected Lord, that changed everything for Paul. It apparently did the same for James. And that's the power of the resurrection. Uh, resurrection is the most powerful fact of human history. And it can change the hardest heart. And, uh, you know, for that reason, we, we refuse to give up on anybody. You know, if Jesus is raised, why would we give up? There are people who still need to respond to the resurrected Jesus who still need to do the will of God, who, who need to confess him. Um, there are people, you know, that need to become like James and, and say, I'm now willing to become a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and the thing that will make that happen is the gospel. Uh, the power of the cross and the resurrection. It did that for James. I'd love to have been a fly on the wall when Jesus appeared to his brother and changed his life. So all that out of uh, James 1.1. 1, 1. I, I hope you're intrigued by, by what James writes. Uh, we will continue looking at some other things 
in the early part of the book next week. Invite you to to, to tune back in, and uh, if you have questions about James or or comments about our study, please uh, you know send them to me. Feel free to comment uh, while we're in the midst of our live stream. Although I can't read them and speak at the same time, I'll check them out later, and then maybe I can see some things you're thinking. But um, I'm looking forward to working through this book with you on Wednesday nights um, for a few weeks. So hope you have a great night. God bless you. Hope to see you Sunday uh, on the Lord's Day when we come together to worship Him. And, um, and God's blessings be on you until then. We'll see you soon.